Um, so I will be talking about density functional theory today. It's going to be a bit of, like, I will, I will hand wave a fair number of things. I will not hand wave some important things, which I believe I understand well, and I can hopefully not mislead you with. Um, so here's a rough outline of what will be happening. This is, this is sort of approximately the plan I, I'd like to follow here. Um, so we're going to go over the Hohenberg cone theorems, uh, given some names I see here, the Hohenberg, like what we call go over will not be good enough. Some other names here, what we call go over will be a bit too much. I will try to sort of tune it depending on audience reaction. So, you know, give me some feedback as we go along. Uh, we'll go over the cone sham ansatz, which is, uh, which is, you know, basically the ansatz that actually makes a lot of modern DFT possible. Uh, also makes a lot of modern DFT kind of shaky. Um, the exchange correlation functional, which we will see, is basically a hack factor, which we hope for the best with. Uh, I'll go over solving the system, because this is actually, it's, it is... It is, when you look at it, it's a very simple process, but like there's so many places to improve on it that it's still an open area of research. I'll go over the physical properties that we get from DFT that are actually really nice and then that are really not nice. Um, and then I'll try to go over like sort of, you know, where DFT is today, um, what, what are sort of the research directions it's moving in and like, you know, why do we care about those research directions, right? So, so let's have a let's have a go at this. You'll notice that LaTeX does not play well with Excel, uh, like Google Slides. So here we are with the backslash size, right? Um, but you know, why do we care, right? Like, like why do we why do we need to do density functional theory? And and the fundamental idea here is, many particle QM becomes rapidly intractable, right? It it becomes very very rapidly intractable. As an example, you know, I've actually put some concrete numbers down here. Let's say you're, you know, you're doing a very simple sort of, you know, uh, beginning of undergrad simulation of consider, you know, I solve Laplace's equ or like the Poisson equation in a potential, right? Um, and I get some, you know, charge density, let's say. And let's say I'm representing this in like a 3D box with, with 100 points along each axis. This is about, this is about a million points. This is no problem at all. Right, you can you can do a million points points on like a wooden PC these days, and it's actually perfectly fine. Uh, if you need, however, a ten particle wave function, right, a full ten particle many body wave function, you're you're gonna you're gonna land in a bit of trouble real quick. Right, you're you're gonna land in a bit a bit of trouble real quick. Uh, and like you know, this 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 intractability of the situation really doesn't improve even with better basis functions. It just it just really doesn't. Right, you know, people, you know, people immediately say, "Well, why represent this in real space? Why not use a better basis set? Why not use localized bases? Or why not use Wannier orbitals for those who know what that is? Or why not use wavelets for those who know what that is?" And I, I, I can tell you that it really doesn't improve the situation. The curse of dimensionality is very real, and it is going to absolutely slaughter you. Right, like there will be pain, suffering, like it just, it just never ends. Right, so. So why do wh wh where do we where do we go from there right we do we want to solve a set of problems we we do want to like you know actually look at you know a computer and say ah perhaps we can actually predict material properties that would be kind of nice um so here's here's a qualitative starting point for the Hohenberg cone theorems right the first Hohenberg cone theorem says that given some density right? Like a particle density. Now, when I say density, I will sort of implicitly be switching between like a particle density and an electron density. It does not need to be this way, right? You can ask people on the server who've done something called nuclear density functional theory, where the densities are not that of electrons and are actually densities of like quarks and gluons and like new subnuclear particles, right? So DFT is a very general thing. It exists for a very general class of like problems. Uh, I will be focusing most, almost entirely, unless you know questions are asked otherwise, on the electronic problem, right? Because I'm a material scientist, and I will be, you know, we're we're sort of dealing with like chemical, roughly chemical or like chemical level physical systems here. So I give you a density, right? If I give you a density, you can determine the external potential, right? Up to, 
let's say some additive constant, right? Um, the additive constant, however, is not really a problem because none of your observables change with the additive constant, right? Like if I, if I had a potential, right, um, and if I shifted this potential up by a DC factor of let's say three, uh, my density wouldn't change, right? The absolute reference point of a potential is meaningless, right? For those who don't actually know what that means. Uh, you can ask me about it later. I'll be happy to oblige. For those who do know what that means, congratulations. Um, the second, uh, and the, the the I guess the second rough, I wouldn't say theorem, but sort of the claim here uh, is a universal functional of the den of the energy in terms of the density, right? Which means once I have the density, uh, or if I have some way of getting the density, and this is sort of the hard part, um, there exists. Uh, a universal functional of density, right, uh, that is going to give me my energy of this of for like a given density, right? This dens this energy includes you know the many body kinetic energy, the many body interaction energies. Like it it's going to give me everything. Like the functional exists. There's a bit of a problem, however. Uh, we don't know what this is. Number one and number two, we don't actually solve this problem right because fundamentally this this problem isn't going to, isn't being made easier for us because you know we have some density we go from the density to the relevant external potential we go from the relevant external potential to the many body wave function we go or and you know the relevant hamiltonian uh, and then we get the total energy right as in number density, duh, okay, there's a question by Bacon Prince going, by density, he means a statistical kind of density as a number density. Um, yes, but this is also taken in a very sort of, you know, you, you want to think about this in a very continuous, here is a 3D continuous function in space kind of manner. So if you're thinking of statistical fluctuations, time averaged out, right? Uh, there are formalisms. I wouldn't say more abstract. I would say like uh, it's very difficult to see uh, extremely rapid fluctuations in electron density, right? Um, so you can actually have a time average density at t equals zero Kelvin. Oh, by the way, I should also mention before I, which I actually have written down here. Uh, Density functional theory, as I'm presenting here, unless I explicitly state otherwise, is a zero Kelvin ground state theory, right? It's going to give me zero Kelvin properties, which you might think, well, you know, what garbage is that, right? Like, nothing's at zero Kelvin. Nothing's at zero Kelvin, but turns out room temperature is close enough to zero Kelvin. It's absurd. I know, I too do not understand, but it kind of is, right? But you can get the number density. It means the electron density. So we're getting a question here on what density means here. It means the electron density, right? Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking, we're trying to get, get like somehow express an electron density that gives us an external potential. And given this external potential, we will know what the many body wave function is. If we know what the many body wave function in Hamiltonian is, then we will know what the energy of the system is. If we know what the energy of the system is, we can minimize this energy, right? And when we find the global minimum of that functional, of you know, this this universal functional of density, in terms of the density, right? Uh, that will be our ground state. Right? So I'm going to move on, but if there are any further questions, you know, let's let's actually g g keep the discussion going later on, right? So you'll notice that the font changes midway. That's because a lot of this, a bit of this has been written by me, and a fair amount of this has been taken out of textbooks that, you know, I believe actually express this in a way that I do not think I can improve on, right? So imagine we've got two external potentials uh, that are not different by just a constant density, right? So so let's say you've got a parabola and you've got a different parabola in terms of a potential, right? Let's say you've got a potential ax squared and you've got a second potential bx squared plus c. So c is your constant shift, but a is different from b, so this is a different potential, right? But now let's pretend, and this is, this is you know, just, just hear me out on this. Let us pretend that these different external potentials lead to the same density. If they lead to the same density, 
right? If, you know, if you for the given if for the same density you have two different external potentials, then you're going to have two different ground state wave functions, right? So, for example, if you look here, we start from the density, we get the external potential, so we go from the external potential to the many-body wave function. And then from the many body wave function, we go to the total energy. Once we have the total energy, we have relevant observables, right? Because almost every single relevant observable out there is some form of like a first or a second or an nth derivative of energy, of the total energy of the system, right? So let's actually start. So let's say psi 1, right? So can you all, can everyone see my mouse? Just, just need to confirm here. Uh, some response. Okay, cool. Um, so, psi, psi 1, right, is the ground state wave function of H1, which is one of the Hamiltonians. Uh, and psi 2 is not, right? That means the expectation value of the energy of psi 2 with the Hamiltonian H1 is by definition larger than the expectation value of the energy of psi 1 with H1. Right. If you don't understand this, uh, we might have a problem in terms of prerequisites. If you do understand this, we, that's actually perfectly fine. Right. Um, so the strict inequality follows of the ground state is non-degenerate, and now immediately we'll have at least a hot five percent of people screeching. But what about degenerate ground states? Right. And the answer is the original proof of hohenberg cohn assumed non-degenerate ground states. This is not a requirement, right? There is a different type of a proof called a Levi-Lieb proof. That's L-E-V-I hyphen L-I-E-B. I do not talk about that here, but the Levi-Lieb proof actually gets rid of the requirement uh, of non of like non-degenerate ground states, right? So, all right. So the expect you know the total energy you know the energy of the of the wave function psi two for the Hamiltonian one. Right can also be expressed as this. You know, convince yourself that this makes sense, right? Uh, because this is just the ground state energy of psi two with the correct Hamiltonian of psi two, right? And this is whatever difference there is, right? So, so I I, I hope this actually makes sense to everyone, right? Uh, however, these two Hamiltonians, right, they have some kinetic energy component, they have some sort of nuclear nuclear component, they have like a bunch of other components. However, the only component that actually differs, right, that isn't exactly equal between these two Hamiltonians is the external potential. Right, which which we've, which, you know, by, by construction, right, well, like we've, we've decided we start off with the difference between two external potentials. And now, if you actually crank this math out, and you know, please feel free to go ahead. You crank this math out, right? This is this is e. Uh, this is actually e sub one, right? E sub one is this, you know, this number here. This is less than e two plus this number, right? Where this is some ground state density, right? Because remember, we have the same ground state density here, right? This is this is pretty much exactly what we discussed. We have the same ground state density for, let's say, two different external potentials. However, you now realize you can do this exact same thing by flipping the things around, right? Uh, uh, what do you mean everything is free? Uh, we have some, like, Hank. If you think that requires more discussion, then we can probably hold it off till later. Right? Uh, but other than that, okay, I'll, I'll answer you when you type it out. All right. So the thing is, you can also, however, do this the other way around. The potential is linear in density. The potential need not be linear in density, but I believe it is. Yeah, let's save it for later. It's fine. Um, it is local though. It's it's a it's a it's a local it's a local potential. Uh, that actually is kind of important later on, right? Uh, is density is assumed to be the same. Uh, the kinetic energy terms cancel because we are assuming that they are equal between H1 and H2. Right? So, for example, if you look at this, if you look at 6.8, right? So, the kinetic energy of this Hamiltonian and the kinetic energy of this Hamiltonian are going to be exactly equal. And they're both, you know, you're looking at the expectation value of psi of 2. So, the kinetic energies will exactly cancel out by construction. 
right? So, but again, like we, we've sort of made this artificial system to do this proof, where the only thing that is different is the external potential by more than a, by more than like a constant shift. Now, you get this result, which I hope everyone is comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with this, we can talk about this later after, like, you know, I'm not going anywhere after this talk. Uh, and they say, you know, you can actually do this the same for the other way around. And if you add 6.10 and 6.11, you're going to come across an interesting contradiction, which is E of 1 plus E of 2 is less than E of 1 plus E of 2. Right? And so this is actually a proof by contradiction. It tells you that you, you actually can't have two external potentials that differ by more than a constant. Right? It's, it's not, that's, not a, that's not a meaningful thing you can actually realistically do. Right, um, I know a, I know at least a few people who deeply dislike proofs by contradiction. Uh, I I don't know how to help you. Right, um, and so I guess this this is the second proof of the Hohenberg cohn theorem, and again there's a bit of a restriction here that's kind of misleading, right? Um, which is, you know, you. What do you mean? We can we can take it up later. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, so the, so now about the universal functional, right? The universal functional is just, it's, it. I, I guess the sad part about, uh, all of existence, right? Is that, uh, my entire field wouldn't exist if, uh, this universal functional was known, right? But unfortunately it is not, right? Uh, so the first thing we're doing is we're restricting the densities that we can actually work with to something called v-representable, right? Uh, in a qualitative manner, what this means is I need to be able to represent this density as the solution of some external potential. This is not always the case. Not all densities are v-representable. As a matter of fact, if you if you want to talk about if anyone wants to talk about it later, any excited state density immediately becomes uh, non-v-representable. Right? So you're you're kind of stuck with v-representable densities. There is a much more over uh, overarching proof using something called n-representable, um, but I don't actually understand that, and I'm actually fairly certain neither does most of the rest of the community. So uh, here we are, All right? So the claim here is that the Hohenberg cone energy functional, right, is a functional of purely the density, right, necessarily purely the density, because again, we want to avoid the many body wave function as, as hard as we can, right? This is your fully interacting kinetic energy, right? You're going to get this from the density. Uh, this is your interaction energy. This is like basically the energy due to the fact that the electrons are near each other. Uh, and this is sort of the energy due to the external potential. And so, yes, I believe, you know, I guess you have your answer here, right? This is, this is linear, right? This is an external potential. It is local and it is linear, right? Um, this, we, we sort of wantonly break this requirement all, every day of our lives, but, but we, can, we can talk about that later. This is the ion-ion interaction energy, which is, I mean, you know, I kind of, I'm going to be real, I don't really care about this a whole lot, just because almost all of DFT is done using the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, uh, where you basically say, ah, consider point charges, right? And you consider point charges, and the ion-ion interaction energy becomes uh, classical electrostatic energy. Right, even even for uh, even if you consider pseudo potentials, which I'm not actually going to get into here, right? But this term, right, this kinetic energy plus interaction as a functional of density, and it's a functional because you know your density is a 3D function, right? Um, this is universal. It is it is a it is a functional of purely the density alone, and as long as you can represent your density in a v-representable manner, right, uh, it is universal. I realize this isn't really a proof as more than a claim. I should have been kind of more aggressive about this one. But oh well, it's a bit too late now. Uh, if you want to look into it, I've got references later and we can talk about it. Um, but there's a, there's a small problem here, which is that, you know, saying that there is 
a density functional is not the same thing as saying that here is the density functional, right? And that's sort of the problem here, which is uh, this is not a constructive proof. Uh, well, even when it is shown more of as a proof, it's not a constructive proof. The, they just, you know, the, the original paper just says, yo, there's a universal functional of the density. Uh, we don't know what it is, though. Good luck, the end. Right? Um, and there are actually some recent results uh, in from the community uh, which basically say that even if we did have the exact functional, right, it would actually very likely be... Uh, yeah, it only talks about existence. Right, right, right. Um, but there are some recent results that basically say even if we did know the, ex uh, the exact density functional, it would actually almost certainly be NP-hard to evaluate. And if something's NP hard to evaluate, like what what's even the point, right? Like why why even go into that? At that point, just, just solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So the way to get around this is this beautiful construct called the Kohn-Sharm ansatz, right? Uh, I will say this right off the bat: this is an ansatz, right? There is no proof that this works. Uh, there are well-known cases where this doesn't work, or it works terribly or entire classes of physics that this will necessarily miss, right? But this is your non-interacting ansatz. You claim that there is a system, right? There is, in, there is an auxiliary system such that it is an independent particle non-interacting ground state, right? And so what does that mean? It means that instead of one single ground state wave function of, let's say, a thousand different coordinates, right, which is which is a thousand dimension, well, which is a three thousand dimensional function in real space, you have three thousand three dimensional functions, or you have about a thousand three dimensional functions. This is nice and can be represented on a laptop. This cannot be represented by the entire computing power of humanity for the foreseeable future. Right, so there's a, there, there's your there's your difference between the two, right? So the hohenberg cohn theorem states that you know if I have a density, I have an external potential. This is the hohenberg cohn link, right? If I have an external potential, I have the many-body wave function. If I have the many-body wave function for some external potential, I'm going to get the ground state many-body wave function, which is going to necessarily give me the ground state density, right? The link that cohn sham gives us is we have the fully interacting density. We ansatz, right? We ansatz that this can give us a cone sham potential, not the external potential here, but some cone sham potential. As you can see, it's still local here, but in all honesty, it doesn't need to be local, meaning that it doesn't need to be only a function of r. It can be a two point or a three point or a whatever point function you so desire, right? Um, this is going to give us a set of independent particle wave functions. For those who are high enough in their training, they'll recognize that you know independent particle wave functions are used to build up Fox spaces, and uh, you can do second quantization with them. Uh, I do not go into that here, but you can actually do this. Yes, you can use the DFT wave functions for like second quantized methods, right? If you've got these wave functions, these non-interacting wave functions, you fill them up one by one, all the way to the number of electrons you have. You sum up their absolute squares, right? Because these, these are non-interacting, so you can just add up their absolute squares as if it's the density. And this, by, by construction, should give you the ground state density, right? The fully interacting ground state density. Um, but again, you know, you do want to keep in mind that this is an ansatz. It works for a certain class of problems. It's a very large class of problems. There are extensions to make it work for larger classes of problems. But there is no proof that this is generally valid. Right? As a matter of fact, there are easy counterexamples. Right? I don't go into them here, but again, they're like, you know, you can actually look this up. It's like counterexamples to Konsham. Right? Um... Uh, I, I, uh, unless you know the potential, uh, how do you even find the interacting wave functions? You never find the interacting wave function. You completely bypass that altogether. The interacting, the fully interacting many-body wave function is something that you never want to lay your eyes on. Right? 
because it has way more information than you could ever want to have. And more importantly, fundamentally, it's just too large to calculate. It just, yeah, you're, you're never calculating that. Right? It's, it's horrendous. Right? Um, so, what you want, the quantity you want, right, is the density. Like, this is your quantity that is going to make your life easy. Right? And this is, this is what you want to know. Everything else here is just a way to get to this. Right? Because the moment I have the density, I can actually perturb the density and I can get my observables. Whatever observable it might be. Right? So, Kaizo, uh, since you were asking, uh, you know, uh, how do you find the non-interacting wave function? Okay. You self-consistently solve, and I will be going into that. Basically, you, in you get an initial guess for your density, uh, you dump it in your solver, your, do your solver gives you a new density, you get a new V cone charm, you get, you use the new V cone charm to get a new set of wave, to get a new density, a new set of wave functions, and you sort of iterate until uh, you achieve self-consistency. And we'll sort of go into what self-consistency means very briefly. Right? Uh, this is actually one of, in my personal, you know, as a practitioner of DFT, it's one of the weakest points, because entire systems that you would like to study, uh, it's a perturbative iteration with the KS onsets. Uh, yes, but it doesn't need to be, I think is the big point here. Right? Uh, there is orbital free DFT. Uh, it's not as well developed because the approximations we need to make there are much more drastic, and we don't f there's we don't really fully understand those approximations too well, right? Um, but yes, you you do need to be ADA like so for those for those who can actually understand what I'm about to say next. Well done. Uh, the cone sham ansatz of doing the cone sham way of dens doing density functional theory. Uh, needs to be adiabatically connected to your fully interacting density. If it is not adiabatically connected, then uh, you're going to have a hard time. There are ways to sort of hack in adiabatic connections uh, by making some quantum numbers bad, right? Uh, this is a thing that we sometimes do uh, by, let's say, as an example, we include spin-orbit coupling, so spin becomes a bad quantum number. Right, um, and this actually allows the Kontram ansatz to, you know, go across quote unquote phase transitions. But uh, Hank is actually completely correct. Uh, if we use the Kontram ansatz, we're sort of stuck to this sort of single particle mean field-ish limitation. There are ways around this using generalized Kontram, uh, but I'm not going to go into that because generalized Kontram is the work of Satan. Right. Um, so, I guess the first, you know, the question here is why do we want non-interaction other than, uh, other than just saying, you know, you know, pretty much the question which we got, you know, why not just have the fully interacting wave function? Well, it's because the approximations that we need to make, right? Density functional theory is a fundamentally different beast than density functional approximations. Density functional approximations need to be made by virtue of the fact that we don't actually know the universal functional, right? And so the problem here is since we don't know the universal functional, you know, we need some way to like claim, ah, look, here's an approximate functional that hopefully is valid within some regime, right? Um, and so the way to do that, right, is you actually try to take out the large, largest possible pieces of the energy you can actually describe without approximations, right? Uh, adiabaticity is an important assumption in Kontram. Yes, yes, it is. It is actually a very important assumption. So uh, I'll, I'll sort of try to go into this later on for v very briefly, uh, which is that, for example, if you actually start off, let's say, a calculation of, let's say, an antiferromagnet, right? and you supply it with an initial magnetic ordering that is not the correct magnetic ordering, you're not actually going to settle into the correct magnetic ordering unless you actually include spin-orbit coupling, as an example. 
right? So so you're not going between ferro let's say anti ferromagnetic states using cone charm. It's it's you know, like good luck. It's not happening. Right? Because you know, like it's very easy for people to say, "Ah, my guy, just find the uh global uh you know, the global minimum of my energy functional." Uh numerically, however, you're going to use some gradient based algorithm. Right, you're going to use like you know BFGS or conjugate gradient or whatever is your gradient-based algorithm of choice, and your gradient-based algorithm is going to look at a function that is non-convex and it's going to say no. Right, this is this is just what is going to happen. Right, EII is the ion-ion interaction, uh, inter uh, interaction energy, right. So it's it's basically the part of the atoms that we don't sort of actively want to consider in the interacting calculation. Uh, I'm I'm sort of deliberately skipping over the discussion of pseudo potentials because it's not particularly core to the discussion of DFT. Right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to move a wee bit fast now because I see that we're we're running a wee bit short on time. But so here's your density. We're, we're summing over all independent particle orbital densities, and we're summing over the spin. Um, if you're a lucky person, you can actually uh, make the assumption of spin degeneracy, and this entire you just multiply by a 2 here. If you're not a lucky person, you have to do a spin polarized DFT calculation. This makes a lot of practitioners very sad. Right? Um, this is the E heart tree. This is sort of the quote-unquote mean field, like, you know, electrostatic energy needed to sort of assemble this density together, right? Uh, this is the independent particle kinetic energy. This is a big benefit of the Kohn-Schramm method where, you know, the Kohn-Schramm ansatz gave us these independent particle orbitals, which I can just systematically go through and calculate the, the Laplacian for and get the kinetic energy of. And the independent particle kinetic energy is going to really con consist, like, you know, it's going to take out a large chunk of my total interacting kinetic energy. So let's say I have a total ener total interacting energy, E interacting, and some non-interacting fraction made up of these two parts, right? Um, and let's say, you know, I guess, and this V external. The approximation is a much smaller approximation now than saying, I want to approximate the entire blob of energy that is the fully interacting kinetic energy and the fully interacting potential energy. It's, it's much more amenable for me to say, let me approximate a tinier, tinier amount uh, than to approximate a, a massive quantity with, like let's say, even 80%, 90% accuracy, which would still be terrible, right? Uh, and now you know it's it's tractable, right? Like you you you're using a single particle basis set, you can you can actually do this, right? You you have a potential, you shove it into an eigensolver, which is a very established field, right? Thank all of our linear algebra overlords, right? You get your wave functions, you take your wave functions, you get your density, you go from your density to your potential. For you know the people who know about this, this is solving a Poisson equation. And you sort of reiterate, and there are, you know, modulo some fancy numerical techniques to help things actually converge. You're going to eventually get, you know, put in a density, and you're going to get out a density that is negligibly different, right? And by negligibly, you know, we are we are practitioners of numerics here, so negligible is not, you know, an abstract quantity. It's some one e minus some integer that you are comfortable with. Right, so are you are you comfortable with the density changing by less than one part in a million? Okay, well that's negligible for you then, right? Um, and so this is actually the definition of E sub X C, right? So the exchange correlation functional is different from the Hohenberg cone density functional. The exchange correlation functional is sort of by definition. Here is an independent particle on Satz. Whatever energy the independent particle ansatz didn't get is the E sub X C. Alright? You realize now that this perhaps isn't the most, you know, amenable to theoretical exploration. Right? You because what I've basically said is everything that is not interacting is not interacting. 
right? This is this is perhaps like a, 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 not, a not hugely helpful description of this term. Nevertheless, uh, the exchange correlation functional uh, has ex rigorous properties that it must abide by, and there are actually like a hot 17 or so of them that have been established to the current day. And we're sort of finding constraints every single day as we go along. Well, maybe not every single day because there are like three people working on this in the world, right? But eventually, over over the past, I want to say, 50 or 60 years, we have come across, you know, rigorous bounds that we know that uh, the exchange correlation functional must obey due to either quantum mechanical limits or causality limits or transfer of information limits, blah, blah, blah. Like, the, the limits exist. So if you were wanting to get into the business of, oh, look, I made an exchange correlation functional, and if you don't actually abide by those limits, someone at the physics conference is going to ream you out for that. I'm not saying they're doing the right thing, but they kind of are. Unfortunately. Right? So, what about this functional? Right? Like, I just told you that, you know, oh, look, we, you know, everything that is not interacting. Well, turns out we don't know what it is. Unfortunate. I, I know this isn't really uh, probably, uh, I guess, uh, you know, increasing confidence in DFT, but we don't actually know E sub KS either. We don't, we don't know this functional. Uh, but the approximations that we do have are actually fairly fantastic, as we will see going forward. And, you know, I really hope to convince you, at least with some sort of, you know, more visual presentation of results as we'll get along, that, you know, it, it does work, right? Like, it, 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 the approximations work. And so, sort of the dumbest close your eyes and roll your face on the keyboard starting point is you have an interacting electron gas, the exchange energy for a homogeneous interacting electron gas is analytically definable, right? Uh, and that's that number over there, right? So this is, you know, this is fine, right? Um, correlation, however, is not. Because correlation is basically saying, here's an interacting system. We took the exchange part of the interaction out. Everything that's left is correlation. And so you notice that correlation is just a fancy way of saying, here is all of the behavior of that 1,000 dimensional wave function that we sort of don't want to talk about and we swept under the rug. And you can see that, you know, this is, we literally actually do not know what this is. There's no closed form solution for this. Those numbers that you see up there, those are, those were determined in a very famous paper by uh, Purdue and Zunger back in 19 whatever. Uh, where they did quantum Monte Carlo calculations of the homogeneous electron gas, and then they actually, and then there are like numerous parametrizations of like the correlation energy as a function of this variable called R sub s. For those who've studied a bit of Fermi liquid theory, or you know just in general have looked into Ashcroft and Merman, you'll recognize R sub s as the wigner scheitz radius. The wigner scheitz radius is a fancy way of saying here is how many electrons I have per unit volume, right? I'm not going to go too much more into that. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up, I believe. If you do know what that is, well, I mean, you know, you're in a good place, right? Um, many other parametrizations exist, right? Uh, and this is, this is sort of where things start to get hairy, and I, 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 I will purposefully be extremely hand-wavy here, more so than the rest of the presentation, because... These are all still active fields of research, right? There is this idea called Jacob's Ladder in density functional theory, where, you know, you're on Earth, which is over here, it actually says Hartree Falk, but often people will say it's just Hartree, right? So not even exchange is taken care of. But when you're on Earth, your many electron problem is described only using, you know, the electrostatic interaction, right? So this, this mean field stat electrostatic term, uh, plus uh, the Fock exchange, right, which is which is this thing over here, or you can do you know exactly calculate exchange for whatever system you have. But you know you do want to get better. This is actually terrible, by the way. This is actually going to be qualitatively garbage a lot of the time, right? So obviously you want to, you want to make life better for yourself, right? You want you want to actually make meaningful predictions, and so you say, ah, let me use local density approximation. Uh, S, P, W, L, S, I don't know what that means, I don't know what L means, I'm almost certain P, W means Purdue and Wang, right? And so, this is one such parametrization, 
right? There are many parametrizations, but almost all of them actually come from that same quantum Monte Carlo simulation back in the day yonder, right? Um, let me actually... Okay, good. Uh, and then we have GGAs, right? I mean, you know, you have the density. If I have the density, then I technically have its gradients, right? I mean, I do. I can I can calculate gradients using finite differences or using analytical expressions, right? If I have the density, then I should probably, you know, use the gradient of the density. And that is actually what, you know, some people do. You can actually tailor expand around the density of the homogeneous electron gas, and you'll actually get the expression of, like, correlation and exchange uh, in terms of the gradient expansion, right? A uh, good thing is, you know, you now have more information, and some some quantities are actually, you know, quantitatively better described. You, you actually get very noticeable improvements. Uh, the bad thing, however, is though, and I'm not going to go into this, it's not unique, right? Generalized gradient approximations are not unique. And so, unfortunately, you, we've ended up with, like, about a hundred of them, Right? And the Pareto distribution of usage, by the way, is, oh, look, I used one of the three GGAs that are actually meaningfully used in the community. Everything else is shenanigans. Right? So if you ever see a DFT paper and you see we used PBE, uh, I'll probably upload them. Uh, can someone upload the slides? Yes, I will upload them onto a channel somewhere. Right? Don't worry about it. Right? Um, and so... You know, realistically, you have a gradient expansion, which is not unique, and so you can sort of tune it for systems that, you know, you know parameters would describe the physics better for. This is actually an open field of research. People have extremely hot takes on this. Some people are like, we should tune nothing. Some people are like, we should tune everything, right? And there's actually the full spectrum in between, right? But then here's the thing. We don't need c the cone sham functional to be purely of density. We c we have these independent particle orbitals, right? We c the co the Hohenberg cone functional is a density functional. The cone sham functional need not be a density functional. There's nothing in any theorem that says you know we we need to make this a density functional. And so we have these independent particle orbitals. We could just find their second derivatives and find their you know positive definite kinetic energies and say ah look. We have more information now. We have we have the independent particle orbital resolved kinetic energy density. For those who for those who actually just you know whose brains melted at that, don't think about it too hard. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you have these things called meta GGAs, right? And then you're like, well, you know, we know the analytical form for exchange from Hartree Fock theory, right? We can we know you know Fock exchange, right? We could just calculate Fock exchange with the cone sham independent particle eigenstates. And yes, you can absolutely do this. There's nothing stopping you. And then you're like, well, if we're calculating cone sham eigenstates, there's nothing stopping us from calculating, you know, unoccupied states, right? We could just calculate unoccupied states, calculate something called the RPA correlation energy, and this will actually give you a fantastic approximation of uh, the correlation energy that can actually be systematically improved upon, right? Um, and so, you know, all of these great ideas are just going about everywhere. People are really pumped, but, you know, people try any of these methods and they realize, ah, look, uh, this is going to take till the heat death of the universe, all right? Well, maybe not as bad, but to give you an idea, I can do a calculation with local density approximation in about one minute, actually five seconds if it's a small system. The same five-second calculation using a GGA will take about also five seconds, right? If we use meta GGAs, your five seconds just went up to roughly 15 to 20 seconds. This is still not too bad, right? 15 to 20 seconds is not something I consider too bad. Okay, sure, you know, we went up 3x in time. We're getting a lot more accuracy, though. But then we're like, oh, what about exact exchange? Your five-second calculation just became a 20-minute calculation, Right? What about virtual orbitals? Your five-second calculation just became a two-hour calculation. So, realistically, you'll only ever see this method used for the tiniest, tiniest of systems. Because while the theory exists, the resources and the algorithms to efficiently implement this does not. We're, this is actually an open research question. 
There are there are groups all over Europe, um, all over certain parts of the USA. Uh, definitely at least a group in Japan um, that is actively trying to find a better way to evaluate this, the RPA correlation energy and exact exchange, much, much, much faster than we do today. And by much faster, I mean like orders of magnitude, right? So, like, realistically, what you're going to do when you do a DFT calculation, right, is you're going to use LDA, which is local density approximation, or you're going to use something called PBE, which is Purdue, Burke, and Ernzerhoff, which is a particular gradient approximation, right? Realistically, that's like, that's like what you're going to do, right? And so, I guess this is going back to a very old question. I, I don't exactly remember who asked, but it was like, you know, how do we even get the external potential? Uh, we get the external potential iteratively. Right, uh, you you start off with an external potential, right? This is your external potential using just the ions. You have an initial guess for the electron density, and you're like, well, but how do we determine an initial guess? Uh, it doesn't matter. Just put in a constant quantity there for all I care. If you have atoms or molecules, just like use some step function ansatz and be like, the density is one inside a certain radius around a nucleus, and it's zero outside. It, it really doesn't matter. It's going to converge to the true density anyway, right? Uh, we have a density, we have a potential, we can then calculate the Hartree potential, and we can calculate the exchange correlation potential. We put the total potential together, we take this total potential and calculate the eigenstates, we add up the eigenstates without coherence, and so the fact that we can do this is the reason we use Koncham, right? I, I hope this, this is actually t uh, sort of, you know, visible correctly, right? I know there aren't, you know, I, there aren't as many pixels as I would like to have, but, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some, right? Uh, and then once you have the density, you see, ah, well, is my new density equal to the old density? If it is, all right, we're good, we move on right uh if it isn't uh there's there's going to be there's going to be a bit of pain and suffering all right and by pain and suffering you're just going to do this again this is a bit oversimplified for those who are interested in let's say more of the implementation details uh there are very i wouldn't say complicated but there are rather subtle and old density up to some tolerance yes yes hankel is correct right um that tolerance is arbitrary but also, let's be real, we do want results for the next grant proposal, so it's probably going to be 1e minus 5, right? Going to be real, right? Um, and so, this tolerance, right, that Hank has mentioned, this old density equals new density up to some tolerance, this tolerance actually depends on what physical observable you care about. Your charge density is going to converge up to physical meaningfulness very, very quickly. The difference of the charge densities, right, uh, yeah, yeah. You you want your iteration to not do much after a while. That is correct, Hank. Right. Um, but like, what is what is considered not do much actually very heavily depends on your observable of choice, right? For this is again, this is not this is not uh, you know a part of the slides, but you know I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some sort of pro insider DFT tips here. Let's say I'm calculating just the total energy, right? And I converge, let's say, my wave functions to a residual change of about. 1e minus 5, right? If I want forces, uh, I'm going to converge them to roughly 10 times tighter. If I want the Hessian, I'm going to converge them roughly 100 times tighter, right? Uh, if I want higher derivatives, roughly as a rule of thumb, for every derivative of the total energy that I want with respect to the potential or with respect to external perturbations, I'm actually going to converge my wave functions an order of magnitude higher in tolerance. Because for those of you who are aware, um, taking the derivative of a noisy quantity makes it much noisier. Right? So the more derivatives we're taking, the more, the more smooth we want our density to be. There are actually ways to make sure your density converges extremely, extremely well. And this is actually a field of like current research where you know, of course my system will converge eventually in 30 minutes, but can I make it converge in 30 seconds instead of 30 minutes? Can I make it converge in two iterations instead of 50? Right? This is an active field of research, right? There's a difference between, oh, look, I can actually do this versus, oh, look, I can do this well. Right? And currently, you know, uh, from, from, you know, from where I sit, the community is focusing an appropriate amount on can we actually do this well, right? 
Um, and so, you know, this is this is sort of a caveat here. If you can't converge your system, unfortunate, right? This is this is sort of a sucks to suck situation, right? And so, being able to converge your Contram system is is sort of like a big deal, right? But once you do this, right, you have an approximation for is your ground state density, right? You're fully interacting ground state density because you don't care about the fact that you used a non-interacting ground state. And Hankel, I know you do, but let's not talk about that. Um, but, you know, once you have your density, you have all of the properties that you plan to get off the density, right? Um, you can get polarizabilities, you can get pretty much... Well, let, me, let me actually attempt to go elsewhere. All right, so a very quick recap for those who actually care. Um, this is your. This is the Kohn-Schramm expression for the density. These are your non-interacting eigenstates. Uh, someone was asking what eigenstates are. I'm gonna be real. I really want to explain that, but I don't think I meaningfully can given the time and content constraints of this seminar. You can't probably ask in the advanced undergrad or like the intro undergrad channel of this server though. Uh, solve the KS system. Get your properties of interest right. You're done. Uh, your Ham your KS Hamiltonian is just this. Your KS potential is this shenanigan, right? These are these are all these are all 3D arrays, right? If you were to do this in a computer, this would be just a bunch of 3D arrays of reals. Well, if we're being nasty, it would be a 3D 3D array of doubles, right? And you'd sort of iterate until these numbers, these numbers, and these wave functions don't really move much, right? So. Now that we've gotten the density, and it t it's taken us 50 minutes to get the theory out of the way, right? Uh, what what observables can we get out of the way, right? Uh, what what observables can we get? What what can we meaningfully talk about? Uh, lattice constants of crystals, bond lengths of molecules, right? Um, basically, equilibrium geometrical properties are extremely good. You will typically get them to within two to five percent, right? Unless you're you know you've got some absolutely absurd demonic lanthanide or actinide, which is still an open field of research, for most things in the main bulk of the periodic table, you're going to get very, very good answers for, here is my lattice constant, and here is my bulk moduli, here is my... B we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Don't worry about it. We'll get to the bad observables. All right. Bulk moduli, shear moduli, again, these are just derivatives of the total energy with respect to some deformation of the lattice constants, right? These are all ground state properties. You can get them very well. And you'll notice how this error, the, the bulk moduli, shear moduli here, is a lot higher than, let's say, the lattice constants, right? And that's because derivatives typically start to get noisy and kind of nasty, right? Uh, there are ways to improve them. That's the that's good part, right? Uh, we can get band structure. Right, we can we can actually get the occupied you know bands. So as long as you are in a single particle band structure picture, uh, you can actually get very good band structure. And so those who've actually done some DFT in their life will be very quick to tell me, but the cone Shaw eigenstates don't have a physical meaning, right? There's there's not there's a, they're a fictitious auxiliary system. They mean nothing. And my response to that is, you are completely correct. Mathematically or formally, you are actually completely correct. They do not have to be, uh, they do not actually have a very obvious physical connection, but it, one, uh, they do. Uh, they're actually first order approximations to the true wave functions of certain systems. Uh, and more importantly, experimentally, right, the, 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 the wave functions seem to match up a lot. They match up exceptionally well. Right. So what else can you get? You can get vibration modes, phonon modes. This is kind of important because, you know, finite temperature studies are actually all the jam these days. Uh, you can get Born effective charges. Uh, for those who don't know what Born effective charges are, it's a way of saying, ah, look, I have an ion inside a material, and roughly it appears to me that this is the charge of the ion in this material. That's what a Born effective charge is. You can look this up if you want. If you'd like to discuss it later, we can. But I, I it's not the most interesting thing, right? Um, thermal expansion, thermoelectric effect, transport properties. These are all things you can actually do, right? Thermal expansion is something we can actually calculate using not too much trouble. Thermoelectric effect is something we can calculate with like a 10-second post-processing after a DFT calculation. 
Transport calculations is something we can do with like, you know, maybe like a 10 minute post processing after DFT calculations. It's not bad. Like you can, you, these are all observables that you can get. And these will, whenever I don't have numbers here on the percentage error, that's because I don't know. I couldn't find a good source for them. Right. Static dielectric constant. For those who don't know what a static dielectric constant is, it's basically exactly you when you open up a, a book of Griffiths and it says uh, D field equals epsilon E field. It's that. Right? It's that epsilon. The end. It's the static. There's no omega dependence. I put a constant E field. What does my material do? The end. And this, this is actually a ground state property, so you can get it exceptionally well from like uh, DFT. And this is how a lot of companies these days, for example, they look for um, high kappa dielectrics, aka high dielectric constant dielectrics for, you know, processors, etc., etc. You actually do DFT to screen tens of thousands of materials at a time, and then you sort of actually look further into the one which are ones which are most promising. What are bad? And like, there's a there's a fair amount of bad, right? Mm. That was some good water. All right. Optical properties for semiconductors and insulators are going to be bad. I'm not going to go into why, but I assure you they're going to be garbage. They're going to be qualitatively nonsense. Right? It's actually perfectly fine for metals. You you try to find optical properties for metals, you're going to have like a great time. Right? Uh, you try to find, let's say, electron energy loss spectra, you're going to have a great time, right, for those who know what that is. But if you try to find out, let's say, ah, what is my optical absorption for lithium fluoride, you're going to get actual garbage, right? It's going to be complete nonsense. Uh, no, it's there's actually a much more complicated idea behind this, which is that in a gapped material, in a semiconductor or an insulator, the excited state electron correlation generally not can be captured by inherently linear iteration. Um, so I don't know enough to comment on that because I don't know if the iteration scheme is linear, but maybe we can actually talk about that. That would be nice to talk about because I know for a fact that, you know, I just showed you that expression for correlation was not a linear expression in terms of the density. Right? And a lot of these terms that you just saw in that whole Jacob's Ladder thing were not linear. So maybe we can talk about that. There might be some interesting insight we can get off that. Right? The electron gas approximations are best for metals. Uh, no, it's not just that. A lot of the time, the electron gas approximation works fantastically, fantastically well because we are... Ma so so I'll, I'll have a textbook reference for this. Uh, we're making two different errors... Uh, in two different terms, and they have the opposite sign, and they cancel out, and life is good. What is happening, why optical excitation energies are actually bad, is because of two reasons. One, the Kohn-Sham unoccupied orbitals are not the true unoccupied orbitals, even theoretically. Right? They're they're not the uh, they're not uh, like they're not they're uh, they're there's a subtlety in how you get unoccupied orbitals, right? Um, and more importantly, in a gap system like, let's say, silicon or, you know, what have you, any semiconductor, right? The excited state electron and the excited hole are actually coulombically bound. This binding energy might be very tiny, but they are coulombically bound, right? And so, a, 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 you really do need to consider electron hole propagation, and there are like Green's functions methods for this. You solve the Bethe Salpeter equation using um, DFT, and it uh, it works out, right? Uh, but DFT alone is not going to do too hot. There's actually a lot of research going into like people attempting to give like nonlinear uh, variables, uh, you know, like nonlinear susceptibilities. Or things like, you know, actually trying to get optical absorption of insulators correct, or at least an improved description. Progress has been made. Confidence remains to be gained. Right? Um, but Hank, I'm sure we can, like, to carry on a discussion about, let's say, gap materials, because I'm not sure what you mean as a gap material and what I mean as a gap material is the same thing. Because what I mean is, consider this as a band gap, the end. 
right? So you may, we may not be talking about the same thing, but I'd like to hear if you have anything in mind with that. Right? So magnetic response from localized electrons is a bit hard, right? Antiferromagnets, Mott Hubbard insulators is a bit hard. As a matter of fact, uh, not many in the community share my opinion on this, but this is actually my opinion. I do not think Mott insulators can be meaningfully described in Koncham DFT, right? This is my firm opinion on the matter because Mott insulators is a fundamentally many particle phenomenon. You're not getting it in a single particle Koncham effective picture. I don't care what hacking you did to get that gap in the middle of like 2 MeV. I don't care. That's not a Mott gap. Right? Like, the end. Right? Van der Waals is very hard. It's getting better, but it's ne it nevertheless remains very hard. Um, for those who are more advanced here, they'll realize that, you know, electrons in an actual material are not actually electrons, right? They're, they're single particle electrons in, in materials. They're quasi-particles. They're quasi-electrons. And, and if they are quasi-electrons, they have a lifetime. Right, and this lifetime is actually the exact same as like when you do a Green's function calculation or you do a Fermi liquid calculation, and you get like quasi-particle lifetimes, right? And DFT can't give you this, right? There's no way you can get that uh, the the tau or the quasi-particle weight lifetime or weight from DFT. You can build on top of this, though. We'll we'll sort of you know very casually go over it later, just as like a one slide thing. So everything from here on out is going to be results. Um, if you are not interested in this, well, I still urge you to stay because I think these results are sort of the, the final money maker for this entire field, right? It's, it's why we do what we do. Um, so, the, uh, so if you go to, the, let's say, the top right, those blue lines are the band structure of copper from calculation. The red lines are experimental data of the quasi-particle bands of copper. And you see, the lower, the farther away you get from zero, the sort of more meaningless and the more deviated it gets. But like near the Fermi level, you're pretty good, right? You're you're pretty good. Those energy dispersions are good, right? Um, if you look at let's say the bottom, which is the gallium arsenide phonon bands, which is this thing here. This is this is fantastic agreement right here, right? And this is, by the way, this is with local density approximation. This is like the garbagioist approximation we have in the entire field, right? And like we still have it so well, right? We these these frequencies, right? These are these aren't centimeter inverse. Like these are correct to within fractions of a terahertz, right? Um, if you look at let's say. Oh, yeah, no, these are great. But I will give you some caveats, which is that, you know, these are all ground state properties, right? Phonons are technically ground state properties. You are perturbing the ground state. So these will actually be... These are non-representatively accurate, right? Um, you'll see this is the band structure for diamond, and this is the band structure from experiment. And now you'll notice here, again, for those who are a bit advanced, you'll notice here that these things, you know, they have a width, right? These are not infinitely sharp like these bands here. And what you're seeing here is these are the quasi-particle bands, so the width here is actually real. This is the quasi-particle with lifetime, right? So if I went, let's say, from this bottom point here and went straight up, right, I would see this, is, this, is, this would be a spectral function for those who know what that means. For those who don't, don't worry about it too hard. Right? But like, there, you, you see, like, this is great. Right? We, we have not only qualitative, but modulo, you know, some scaling factors, quantitative agreement into like dispersion relations, band curvature, like things are looking good. Right? And, and we did this quite literally by saying, one, let's consider the, the you know, uh, interacting electrons are non-interacting, and then let's consider the non-interacting electrons are actually non-interacting homogeneous electron gas electrons. We've made some horrifyingly drastic approximations along the way. And despite all of that, we're within a percent for phonon band structures and electron band structures. More, mo more stuff, right? Um, so this is, uh, I have the, uh, so this is, you know, for those who want the archive DOI, go for it. This is a Microsoft Word written paper, so if that is going to make your eyes bleed, I guess don't go for it. Um, 
But for example, here here is one of the newer functionals like vdwdf opt b88. This is like one of a one of the new newer functionals that actually includes van der Waals interactions. Um, this is the bulk modulus from experiment. This is the bulk modulus from the functional, and things are looking good, right? Like like except you know you'll find the occasional discrepancy. Like you know germanium is a bit of nonsense here. Um, I guess is there is there anything else that I can sort of you know. I guess gallium arsenide is, you know, not the most comfortable, right? But everything else, these are, these are like, you know, they're actually typically within 5 to 20% of each other, like I said, right? Like, these are, you know, you could, if I, if you gave me two materials and one of them had a bulk modulus of, like, 7.5 and the other one was, one was 323, I could tell you that in roughly about three minutes on a laptop. Right? You'd never have to manufacture it, you'd not have to synthesize it, you'd not have to make it in the lab, you'd not have to do tests. I could just tell you, if you want a harder material, make the other one. The end. Right? For those who are interested in a bit of more, ex uh, you know, exquisite physics, this, this, is, this is personally something that I've only just been getting into, you can actually get magnon dispersions from DFT. This is done using linear response uh, time-dependent density functional theory, and you can, you know, the, the, the agreement here is great. And you'll, you know, you know, some people might look at this and be like, well, what about that kink here? Do you, can you describe that? And the answer is, I don't know. There may be more sophisticated formalisms out there that are built atop of DFT that might be able to like, capture this physics, or it might just be experimental error. Who knows, right? You know, I consider this fairly fantastic agreement for something whose energy range is actually this small. This is, you know, this is in the milli EV. You're getting energies that are accurate to, like, typically an EV, a milli EV or two. This is great. The triangles are silicon-doped iron, by the way. So their dispersion is different because they've been doped with silicon. But the iron, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Right? Um... So I guess, you know, what happens, you know, eventually I'm going to get to bad, right? I'm going to I'm going to get to like, you know, where where does the garbage begin? And the garbage begins with dielectric functions. And I know a bit about this because this is literally what I do to get paid, right? In DFT, you see this little thing here that says plus scissor 0.55 EV. What this basically means is we hacked in a number and pushed the conduction bands for those who don't know what that is, I'm sorry, we can talk about it later. For those who do, congratulations. We hacked up the conduction bands by about half an EV because DFT got them wrong by half an EV. The valence bands are fine. The occupied bands are fine. The unoccupied bands are no bueno. Right? So we had to push them up. And even then you see, like, this is, this is not good, right? This is, this is just really not good. Right? Like... It's it's missing a complete peak here. It's you know this peak is overestimated by like a fair amount. The absorption you know the oscillator strengths here are a lot larger. So they're systematically larger than they would typically be. Like yeah, this is this is not good, right? But you'll notice something that the static dielectric constant for both experiment and theory they are rapidly converging to the same value. So the static dielectric constant is going to actually be in fantastic agreement. Typically to within, like, you know, one or, like, under one, right? I think the dielectric, uh, the static dielectric constant of silicon is, like, 11 or 12 or something. And, like, with DFT, you'll also get, like, 11 or 12 or something, right? Um, but, no, but the good thing is you can actually use the DFT independent particle wave functions uh, to do better methods. So there's a method, you know, when you solve the bethe Salpeter equation... Also, Hank, thanks for being so charitable. Uh, if only a lot of the DFT community was just as charitable, right? Um, so if you if you uh, you know if you do let's say you know the Bethe Salpeter equation on top of oh don't worry the experiment let's have worse data than this don't worry about it, right? Um, then you know you actually capture a lot more of the relevant physics and you start seeing agreement between the peaks, right? You start seeing, ah, the absorption edge is correct, uh, the, these two peaks are correct, and these are called exciton peaks. And the bethe salpeter equation, by the way, you know, uh, there are many forms of the bethe salpeter equation, right? So we're going we're gonna to go with the bethe salpeter equation for excitons, right? 
Uh, static grounds properties securely well. The dynamic results. Eh, yeah, that is correct. That is uh, doomed. That is that is actually correct. St anything static or ground properties is going to be fantastic. Uh, the dynamic properties are an open topic of research and are being improved upon every year. I think we're we're in a much better place, and you'll and hopefully I'll convince you that we're in a much better place in the past five years, right? So. For a, a very, very quick sort of uh, digression, for those who know Green's functions, methods, and Fox spaces, uh, you'll realize back in the classes when you did, when you made up, let's say, your, in, your sort of interacting Green's functions by using the non-interacting free electron wave functions, right? You did the free electron wave functions because it was on a textbook and you had to do it with pen and paper. But now that you think about it, the DFT wave functions are independent particle wave functions. So you can actually use these wave functions and do Green's functions with them, right? You can perturbatively add corrections, you can resum, you know, to whatever order you want, for those who understand what that means, right? Like, you, you, can, you can get, like, finite temperature Green's functions this way. It's fine, right? I haven't put plots here on this, but you can actually uh, rigorously calculate Berry's phase from this for different materials as well. If you have your ground state eigenstates on their energies, Right, you'll need the eigenstates, right? Um, but if you have them, then you can actually calculate. Ah, here is my churn number, right? Or here is you know some other topological invariant, presumably that you can get that I'm not too well versed in, right? But these are properties that you can get, and like you know the works for them exist, and this is actually a very big uh, subfield of DFT where people are like, yo, can I just throw seventy thousand materials at a supercomputer? and come out with like the most easily manufacturable topological materials, right? And uh, I, yeah, they're, they're going to be correct like almost always because actually I'm fairly convinced topology is a ground state property, right? I might not be correct about that, so I'm not, don't quote me on that, right? Uh, Hank, if you actually have a word on that, that would be great. Like, is topology a ground state property, right? Require a gap-protected phenomenon. Um... I mean, we do get fat bands, flat bands um, in DFT, uh, and I know that topology using DFT is something that is actually explored today on, like, you know, people are filing, like, legitimately tens of millions of dollars worth of grants for it. The early results are extremely promising, but I guess it's also more of a matter of, we can do it, sure, but can we do it well? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so we can do topology with DFT, but can we do it well, and can we do it in, like, are we doing it efficiently is currently still an open question that is actually being re researched. Like, this is an open question, right? So this is, I, I think uh, we're sort of nearing the end here. What is the bleeding edge of observables here, right? Like, like what is what is going on in the past two years, three years, four years? And again, this would be multiple slides worth, but I have put in the, the result that I consider to be uh, the nicest, right? That I personally find the most interesting, which is, uh, I didn't explicitly mention this at first, but, you know, I, I, I sort of mentioned it in passing, where... You know, the observables that we were, we were calculating, right, they were all under the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, right? We were pretending that the ions don't move and that zero-point motion does not exist and the nuclei are classical and, you know, all of, all of the good things that make life easy, right? That's that's all. These are all of the things that we were pretending. But obviously, this is not the case, right? Like, uh, the absorption spectrum for an indirect gap semiconductor at finite temperature is going to be very different from let's say, a direct gap semiconductor, or even a metal, right, like at zero Kelvin. Like, these are these are going to be different quantities. And so very recently, um, and, you know, if someone wants, I haven't put the citations here because, like, this is from, like, a Zacharias and Justino paper. If anyone wants the links, I can send them in later. Um, but finite temperature properties, any, so this method, the, 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 the plot where, the, this plot, this comes from a paper which is a series of papers that says, if there is an observable, that you can calculate, right, using Fermi's golden rule, then I can give you its finite temperature version. This is fantastic, because you can calculate a lot of observable uh, observables with Fermi's golden rule, right? And so here is a really nice sort of, you know, comparison between experiment and theory, where, you know, the zero Kelvin theory, 
uh, sort of absorption edge drops off in silicon like that, right? Because this is sort of the direct gap, right? But the moment you include phonons, right? And I'm not going to go into the details of how phonons are included, but they are, right? You get fantastic agreement for finite temperature absorption. This is amazing, right? Like this is these these are these might as well just be the same line. You even get you get like a quantitative description of temperature effects, right? Like you're changing the temperature. What's happening is you've you've calculated the phonon modes beforehand, and you're actually getting the phonon renormalized quantities. It's an expensive calculation, but we can do this, right? We can say, ah, look, you remember that ob that quantity that we calculated for the ground state? Turns out it actually changes in a non-trivial way at finite temperature, right? So there, uh, the, this is actually people are just you know bum rushing this particular topic right now all over the field where they're like finite temperature this finite temperature that, and it's getting a lot of attention, right? Uh, because you know we've been ignoring it for so long, and finally we have a good theoretical framework to like talk about this, and you know people are just going at it, right? Uh, non adiabatic dynamics. This is when. Um, your potential energy surface, this is a bit advanced, so you know if you don't get this, it's fine. Uh, if you do get this, congratulations. Uh, this is when the potential energy surface of your system is not a single potential energy surface. Right? Uh, that has not been verified by experimentalists. Uh, okay, so the question is, has DFT made any prediction so far that has not been verified by experimentalists? Um, there are a few. Most of them have to do with materials that have not yet been synthesized, right? But a lot of the time, what P, you know, DFT will make predictions about, hey, this is probably a nice ba material for a battery electrode, or this is probably a nice material for, let's say, you know, a low absorption, uh, let's say, waveguide material, or it'll make a prediction about, you know, this material probably has an extremely high, let's say, ferroelectric constant, right? And uh, it, there's, a, there's a bit of a lag between um, experimental realization and uh, computational exploration. Also, Zilatis has a point, which is that, you know, the photosynthesis stuff is very interesting, but charge transfer is, uh, I'm going to try to keep it kosher, difficult, right? Charge transfer excitations are difficult. In DFT, and this is actually going back to sort of the Konsham ansatz, where uh, th th the problem is that using something that is known as a single reference uh, is not particularly amenable to charge transfer excitations. Uh, we are getting there, though. We are, we are getting there. Um, and then there is obviously the thing of about exact factorization, where you straight up say. Well, you know, what if we don't consider the nucleus classically? What if we just say, well, just give the nucleus its own wave function, right? Um, we actually have at least one exact factorization expert in this channel. Um, but yeah, to the I don't understand this too well, but to the best of my understanding, which is again, not a lot, is that you actually consider the fact that the nuclei and the ionic motion has its own wave function. So you do a full quantum mechanical treatment of both the electrons as well as the nuclei. You just factor out the wave functions so that you don't have to cry, right? Is is my understanding. But you know, so lot is if you want to actually give a seminar on this, go for it, right? So, I guess to go even further beyond, what can you do once you've done a DFT calculation, right? Give me a sec. I'm gonna get some water. So, for those who are bored out of their minds, you'll be happy to know that we're about to end soon. For those who are not, thank you for sticking around till the end. Uh, you know, what can we do with DFT, right? Because DFT is not the be-all and end-all, right? It, it is by no means a powerful theory, right, in, in the grand scheme of things. It's got some extremely powerful starting points. Um, it's got a lot of things going for it. But a lot of, you know, a lot of observables and a lot of techno techniques and a lot of, uh, you know, a very novel modern physics remains, you know, to be dis to be able to be studied, right? It's, it's difficult. We actually don't know how to study a lot of the physics present yet, right? So, we you, you can do the following things, right? You can use the DFT single particle wave functions to do interacting Green's functions, right? Um, 
there's an entire class of methods called GW methods that actually do exactly this, right? And they actually give you fantastic agreement even for the conduction band electrons, right? The conduction band electrons, which, you know, DFT, for those who do DFT may know, DFT is typically kind of bad at estimating them, but again, that's because they are not the same thing. Uh, if you do a Green's function method using DFT, you're going to do get just exceptionally good answer. We're talking like a mean squared error across large data sets of, you know, 0.2 EV or, you know, under a tenth of an EV, right? You're going to get really good answers, right? Um, I guess I forgot space here in study even, but, you know, let's not talk about that. Um, we, can, we can refine the numerics to study larger systems. There is active research going on into how to solve the Eigen problem faster. There is active research going on on how to like get fewer iterations to get to my density. There's you know people are asking you know what uh, what is what is a you know what is the most reliable and the fastest way to get you know observables you know because there are there are like five different formalisms to get the absorption spectrum from a DFT calculation right. And so, which one works better? Which why does each one work? What is the benefit? What is the scaling? What is the efficiency? These are these are logistical issues, but it, they are issues that need to be uh, actually paid attention to. Because ten years ago, we couldn't, you know, just hearing someone say, "Oh, we did GW on fifty-five thousand materials," was a completely unthinkable phrase, right? And now, you know, due to the work, due to some fantastic work by like absolute, you know, behemoths in the field, uh, we can actually do this with our eyes closed, right? You do, you know, we can actually fully automate the procedure. It's like, oh yeah, we did DFT, we did GW, we did DFT, we did GW. Rinse, repeat, fifty thousand materials over a week, right? You can scan them. You can find uh, numerical analysis research. Yes, yes, a lot of this, a lot. I think a lot of DFT is very amenable to uh, classical numerics. It's very amenable to machine learning and like uh, neural network. Uh, and before before anyone just screeches into their mic at that, um, I am all for uh, machine learning and neural networks and all other of these funky flavor of the month techniques, as long as I am using them to get to the answer and they are not my final answer. Right. Um, as long as that is the case, I am perfectly fine with it. Right. Uh, yeah, Jacob, does it work with blockchain? There has actually been at least one paper that has, in fact, done a Hartree-Fock calculation on the blockchain. I do not understand why they did this, but apparently it was a thing that people wanted to do. Right. Um... So, very last thing I just want to say, which is, you know, I want to go back to, you know, the fact that, you know, we still have to make these density functional approximations, right? Life has remained hard because fundamentally, even though DFT is an exact theory, we're making the Kohn-Sham ansatz, which restricts us. We're making density functional approximations, which restricts us. We're stuck with adiabatic connections, which restricts us, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Right, like these are these are these are hard. These are these you know DFT being an exact theory tells us nothing if we can't calculate meaningful results out of it, right? And so this is this is sort of a little table I found in in a little paper which I hopefully have linked. Uh, there we go, there we go. That's that's the paper. Sorry for the demonic DOI, right? Where they actually look at the mean squared error and the mean average deviation, right? Uh, mean absolute deviation. My bad. Uh, of observables from, you know, fairly precise uh, experimental quantities, all right? Um, and so you'll start to see, so roughly as you go from here to this side, you're considering more and more physics, right? So Hartree-Fock is just electrostatics plus exchange, the end. SPW92 is Purdue and Wenger, this is your LDA. PBE is your gradient expansion. TPSS is your yeah pb pb zero is good my guy it's absurd right uh tpss is a meta gga so it's actually using that kinetic energy from the independent particle cone charm orbitals right uh there's tpss h right the tpss h is i don't actually know what it is presumably it's an improvement there's pbe d3 
D3 is a sort of a semi-empirical way to account for van der Waals interactions. And you start to see, ah, this is, this is still not bad. This is all right. TPSS D3, PBE0 D3. And by the time we get here to like TPSSH D3, these, these deviations are tiny. Right? These are, these are actually under a kcal per mole for most things. This is chemical accuracy. Um, I think scan would be somewhere between TP... So, scan alone would kind of suck here, because van scan doesn't include van der Waals. But scan with RVV10, which is a particular way of representing van der Waals, right, would probably fall somewhere between PBE0 D D3 and TPSSH D3. Right? Um... So yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is roughly a timeline. I mean, it's not actually a timeline, but this is a rough timeline of, you know, how it started and uh, how it's going. Right? This is this is roughly how it started and this is how it's going and this is this is pretty good, right? Like we went from atomization energy mean squared error of like 120 k cal per mole to, you know, under half a k cal per mole. That's amazing. And we've done all this by pretending everything's a homogeneous electron gas, and by further pretending that everything is non-interacting. Right? So, like, we've done we've done pretty well. Right? Um, so, I guess, final thing, for those who care, uh, basically the four textbooks which I've taken effectively the entire material of these slides from. Um, and, like, if you read these texts, you'll actually see direct screenshot copy pastes right uh from from the first two texts but i use the third text to like you know sort of clear up some of my own concepts and the fourth text will actually tell you why garbaggio approximations like the local density approximation actually work so fantastically well so much of the time Right, um, and it's because of error cancellation, right? If there are two parts that are roughly, uh, let's say, size 2 and size 8, and if I make a 20% error in the size 8 term, and if I make an 80% error in the size 2 term, and if the errors are of the opposite sign, I'm having a good day. I'm going to be real. I'm having a good day. Right, um, and that's a lot of the reasons uh, why, unfortunately, the earlier DFT things worked. It was because of error cancellation. People did not expect it to work as well back in the 80s and the 70s, uh, and then it just really did, right? People were like, you know, what is even going on? And the answer was, we were canceling errors, right? Um, and we still do. We still cancel errors, and it works out well for us. All right, that is that actually about wraps it up. That's roughly what I had in mind. I hope it wasn't uh, too hand-wavy. If it was, um, then I can hopefully refer you to resources that are not as hand wavy, right? Um, I know that there's a very large spectrum of skill levels here, um, from people I've never seen on chat to like you know people who I absolutely know have like very defined skill sets that far far exceed my own. So I guess you know it's a, it's a bit of a new experience trying to like cater to all of that that entire audience at the same time. But yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about this further, um, there are at least a few practitioners of DFT on the server, uh, including but not limited to me. Uh, actually, by no means limited to me, now that I think about it. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone wants any questions that I can actually meaningfully answer without stumbling and sort of, you know, saying nonsense, uh, we can either answer it on air here for the recording, or uh, I guess we can... We can talk about it later as sort of time goes on in different channels and, you know, sort of over time. Right? Uh, how do we get better at charge transfer and double excitations? So, there are... So, for charge transfer, you can... Uh, good night, Jacob. Thank you for attending. Um, for charge transfer excitations, we can do something called constrained density functional theory, uh, which is... It's basically a way of saying you've added a fictitious term to make a charge move around, right? Um, it actually, there's a rigorous basis for this, and it works fantastically well, right? Um, for double excitations, uh, for like a, like, yeah, like a V constraint, 
and you typically add it on let's say one atomic site and you sort of turn it on so that let's say the charge on one atomic site moves to another atomic site because it sort of get it sort of get like you know sloshed out of that potential right that's that's roughly how you would do a charge transfer excitation um, there are I know some people are working on uh, like funky RPA like long range corrected RPA to like do charge transfer excitation but I'm not too sure about that for uh, well known RPA yes yes for those who don't know this is the random phase approximation um, the Bowman Pines random phase approximation the the Gelman and Bruckner random phase approximation is slightly different um, but uh, all right Hank we can we can discuss it fine don't worry about it if you if you've made a note of them then we can I can absolutely discuss it whenever you want I, I don't I don't know if my answer will be satisfactory but hopefully I will be refer you out I will be able to refer you out to resources which do have satisfactory answers to that at the very least right uh, to to lot of the second question which is what are what about double excitations there is there's this is an actually uh, not only an open field of research this is actually something people are really looking into right now um, oh sure yeah 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 Hank go for it um, uh, which is we're we're looking into double excitations from both the perspective of you know Bessé saltpeter equation uh, which is a post DFT method as well as time dependent density functional theory and there is a particular thing known as the the, the time dependent exchange correlation potential uh, which we have so far up until well, like for the past 20 years we've pretended that it actually has no f time dependence right but you know you, you you do need to get rid of that that little that little um, approximation to get double excitations right um, and people are actually working on time dependent exchange correlation kernels in an attempt to actually describe uh, double excitations, there has been some success about satellite with satellite plasmons and like um, double excitation peaks in organic like crystals. Uh, lots, lots left to be done. There's a there's definitely like a non-trivial amount of work that's still happening. Right. So if anyone has any further questions. Uh, that I can answer. If not, I guess we can move on to Hank. Also, this is all still recording. If you would like to ask these questions off recording, then you know that is also fine. I'll we, I'll stop recording eventually, and then like we can continue the discussion here, right? Um, oh yeah, don't worry about mm -hmm. it, pugs. Um, I've been meaning to do this for a very long time, and uh, you know this. I I don't think I did the best job I could. But hopefully this is a good intro to like you know what's happening. What are quasi particles? Uh, so it turns out when you have an electron in a material, right? Um, that electron is not actually like a very simple, like an independent electron, right? It has it has some properties that distinguish it uh, from a free electron that you would like calculate in let's say you know, a quantum mechanics one class, right? In like an infinite square well or whatever have you, right? Um, and so a quasi particle is just a way of saying, I don't want to consider the many particle wave function. I want to consider what a single particle would look like while accounting uh, for the many body effects. Uh, quasi roughly stands for fake. Yeah, it's like, it's like a fake particle, right? Um, if you want to look into it, you know, just just Google quasi particle, and you will be you will be met with a lot of cool stuff, right? But realistically, uh, what what a quasi particle is is it's a way of thinking about particles in an in a fully interacting system that actually makes them amenable to discussion. All right, Hank, let's uh, let's hear your questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, so basically, if I understood DFT correctly, um, what you do, so I I'm going to walk through my thinking here mm -hmm. and you interrupt me if, yep, yep, yep. Um, if I make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So what you do is basically you make a guess about what the um, potential is like, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. it's a cool like potential, right, right, completely right. classical, mm -hmm. and you begin with a linear superposition of um, these single particle states, right? As your right, density. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. 
and then you you know you do computation of like like you plug in your um your density into the right. cone shell yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. functional and then you do calculations and then you solve this single particle uh equation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you update your density so right. um uh -huh. um so yeah i mean at in in my mind this sort of it, this looks free like it's a completely free it's basically like s matrix um per perturbative scheme right so i would be hmm. i guess the subtlety here is that this is cone sham density functional theory not density functional theory as a whole right uh oh, the cone sham auxiliary system is just a way to make life easier for us uh, and make like the problem of the approximation more tractable. There is orbital free DFT, which Zelotis, as you can see, sort of casually just mentioned in in chat, where there are no single particle eigenstates. Right? It's just we operate with the density alone. Right? But the problem with the single particle, with uh, you know the thing like uh, with uh, orbital free DFT is that uh, if you if you can see the slides, these terms right the the t sub s term and the e heart treat well i guess the e heart treat terms there but the t sub s term this is actually a large this is the non-interacting independent particle uh kinetic energy right and this is actually a very large fraction of the full interacting kinetic energy right and the reason why orbital free dft is not as popular as much as everyone here would or at least the practitioners here would like it to be is because we don't really have like a sort of an encouraging approximation for the kinetic energy from purely the density alone right mm -hmm. um if we could and there's a lot of work going on that right now in APS 2019 I saw a beautiful talk where Emily Carter and like one of her grad students did uh, like a beautiful study of like um, just you know getting a good meaningful orbital free functional and some of the results were extremely encouraging uh, but unfortunately we are stuck to the cone sham ansatz for the moment uh, by virtue of the fact that it gives us the independent particle kinetic energy which is which makes the approximate which makes you know the approximation practitioner's life much easier right uh, but yes, you were actually perfectly okay. correct in saying that, you know, well, you know, if it's not adiabatically correct, connected to my interacting system, well, what happens then? And the answer is, is kind of, it's kind of a sucks to suck situation, unfortunately. Mm. Right. Because the, right. Because it might, uh, like, as you said, like, uh, maybe, you know, taking, making the choice to use the constant, uh, energy instead mm. of, you, you know, just the free energy right, right if right, right. not the free hamiltonian maybe that's a better um approximation but basically in in my mind right doesn't matter what um energy function you take mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you take like there's no way that you can get the full non uh sorry there's no way to get the full interacting solution the ground states or the density mm -hmm by iterating or summing perturbative series based on a non-interacting uh, state. So I guess... So that's Hawke's theorem, yeah. Oh, right, right. So I guess sort of the, the sort of question I have here, and again, it's a question because I'm not entirely sure about this, which is I don't know if an SCF iteration using like fairly large nonlinear terms, like... This is this is not linear in the density, right? Like this this nonsense right here is is not linear in the density, right? Um, and mm -hmm. most functionals in general that are used today are absolutely not linear in the density either, right? So I don't actually know if there's a subtlety that prevents this, but if you remember, <coughs> if you go back to the very beginning, we did restrict. Uh, the cone sham to like v you know cone sham auxiliary system and we did restrict this universal functional to v representable densities right so mm -hmm. i'm not entirely sure and you know I, I probably sound extremely stupid here but i'm not entirely sure exactly how hogg's theorem would play into this right because um, i haven't yeah. i haven't considered the cone sham like auxiliary system to be a perturbation 
right? Because, like, you know, to me, a perturbation is even when you resummit, right? Like, I, I don't see, like, a resummation reformulation of the cone Shaw iterations is not immediately manifestly obviously uh, obvious. No, no, it's not. It, it's it's definitely not. But in like in if you even if you you know put in nonlinear terms and a density in your Kohn-Sham um, energy functional, mm -hmm. basically like in each iteration step, you're still solving a single particle um, Schrodinger equation. That is correct. Yeah, so what I mean to say is that in that scheme, right, mm -hmm. those, in each step, you're still getting, like, single particle densities. Like, you're not getting away with that. And when you even write down that equation, that Schrodinger equation, you're implicitly assuming that you can use the single particle basis in your states. That is your correct. Hilbert space. Yes. Space. Yeah. And that's where Hox theorem comes in. Right? Hux theorem says that there's no unitary transformation between the interacting Hilbert space and the non-interacting Hilbert space. So, mm -hmm. like, it doesn't matter how many nonlinear terms you take in your Kohn-Sham energy, right, right. because the energy, those terms are determined in the prior uh, iteration, right? Right. So the equation you're solving in each step is still linear, it's still perturbative, it's still free. Like it's still a single particle. Right, right, right. So yeah. the answer to this that I have right now, which is going to be, again, extremely qualitative, is there is a problem that is known in DFT as the single reference problem, which is we are using mm. a single uh, Slater determinant, right? A single reference state to calculate our density, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is well known that there are definitely some densities... Uh, thanks for attending, Float. Um, that it is well known that there are some densities which cannot be represented faithfully in a single reference framework. Right? The way around mm. this that people have found is to do multi-reference methods, which are exceptionally expensive. Right? Um, I guess the mm. other thing is, and, and this is sort of the experimentalist side of me talking, right? Which is that we've taken densities from DFT and we've done AFM on, let's say, you know, materials, right? And the two densities actually agree fantastically for a large class of materials. And where it doesn't agree, all of the other observables will also go to shit. Mm -hmm. Right? So I completely agree with you that, you know, I'm, I'm going to take your word for this, that there's almost certainly a very deep mathematical reason why I wouldn't be able to get, like, the fully interacting density using a non-interacting, you know, sort of auxiliary system, right? I, I, I agree with that, mm -hmm. that that is almost certainly the case. Uh, I will also tell you that this has almost certainly been looked into by people who are much smarter than me, and I just don't know about it because it's not something I've ever looked into. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's it's more of a matter of me getting the results across to you that is lacking than presumably the results lacking themselves, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? yeah no, definitely. Um, because I definitely learned a lot about, like, DFT and... You know, the the entire point I, I'm here is because I want to understand why Slender thinks DFT is non perturbative mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it appears to not be the case, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, I mean... So I guess the situation the, here is the cone charm yeah. ansatz is, is, you know, it's in a sense a variational ansatz, right? Mm -hmm. um, to me, I have typically uh, thought about as variational ansatzes to, as like the sort of complement to perturbative approaches, right? The self-consistent uh -huh. solution uh, might, you know, it, it might, in fact, you know, we're perturbatively correcting it, right? Um, but like I said, there are actually ways to sort of, you know, somewhat counter, like sort of circumvent the adiabatic connection problem. But it's still, it's, still a, it's still a bit of an open field of research. Like people are still looking into why this happens, and a lot of a lot of the fundamental physics of exchange correlation functionals, and a lot of the fundamental physics that goes into let's say single reference descriptions of these fully interacting states, right? It's it's not as well established as we would like, mm -hmm. right? And a large part of this is because you know you really don't start stretching out the limits of a theory 
until you start stretching out what you can reasonably see with the theory, right? And and DFT and with DFT, you haven't really been able to do that up until like I want to say maybe ten years ago, when you know we had these massive supercomputers where we just said, consider these fifteen thousand atoms. I'm going to throw this. I'm going to throw cores at this problem, right? And then they did it, and then mm. they realized, huh? It turns out that there are some subtle restrictions that are not being obeyed. What's happening here, right? Um, if you're actually interested in this, there's a text by Engel and Dreisler. I don't know if you know of this, uh, but you can look it up. It's called Density Functional Theory and Advanced Course. It is by Eberhard Engel and Reiner Dreisler. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is an extremely... I, I think this is actually a text that you would enjoy because it actually focuses on the strict physical and mathematical bounds of what a, you know, what DFT as a formalism and what density functional approximations must obey, mm -hmm. right? So I think it will be much more amenable to like you know get your questions answered from actually experts on the field. Like like to give you an idea, right? Uh, this text is actually it's it's a, it's a Springer category that is theoretical and mathematical physics, right? So you're not going to see phonon dispersion curves here. What you're going to see is you know, by so-and-so theorem, uh, this value of the exchange correlation functional can never exceed this. Mm -hmm. Right? You'll, you'll see sort of claims like that. You'll see hard bounds. And currently, we have about 17 yeah. or so. Uh, I've seen, like, these... Um, because the adiabatic theorem, like, if you want to prove it rigorously, they also do it in terms of, like, um, estimates. Mm -hmm. um, in operator theory, for example. Right, so, right. yeah, I'm not surprised. Like, if you... Yeah, that will actually be kind of interesting to see how the scheme works out. But, um, I, I mean, my, my only comment about Hawk's theorem is that, like, yeah, um, I guess it's surprising that um, you can use this single-particle scheme uh, to actually get some uh, good agreement with uh, observables, but mm -hmm. the fact that you don't get agreement with any other observables, the bad ones, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a manifestation of... Um, Hack's theorem. Oh, definitely, definitely. That, I completely uh, agree with you. That's, that's the... And, and ha well, I mean, Hack's theorem says that you can never get every single observable, but, you know, you, you can do right, right, that, right? right? That's pretty... Uh, yeah, so that's pretty believable. A, a, yeah. a subtle counterpoint to this, um, something you do want to keep in mind, is that many methods exist on top of DFT, right? Um, DFT is, mm -hmm. you know, for for pr bleeding edge practitioners of the field, let's say people in my group or you know my advisor or let's say her advisor and so on and so forth, DFT is just mm -hmm. like a tool for us that starts off a long journey, right? We will do DMFT with this. We will do something called the GW method with this, which is, you know, it's, it's Green's function method, where you actually expand the interaction in the Coulomb, inter uh, you expand the self-energy in the Coulomb interaction, right? Um, and that will actually give you fantastic observables for excited states, right? It will give you quantitative agreement for excited states. No free parameters, right? Um, you can solve the bethe Sol peter equation. You can get fantastic agreement for exciton binding energies mm -hmm. and excitation lifetimes right so of course yeah. the formalism exists it's just a difference of whether it is dft itself or it's using dft as like a single particle starting point mm -hmm. right of um, course like i can i can imagine you instead of using a density you use the green function for example and then you Instead of the Schrodinger equation, you put in the Bethe Salpeter, mm -hmm. and um, and you yeah, get and, and you get excitations, get, you get optical excitations, yeah. absolutely, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so, and it will give us like you know, this is your two-particle eigenstate, you know, and you know you can't plot that easily, right? Like, how do you plot a two-particle mm -hmm. eigenstate, right? Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, this is actually still this is a visualization question. It's like, how do you even plot an exciton, mm -hmm. right? But definitely the formalism exists. And it's actually actively being improved upon for multi-particle states, right? Like, what happens if you have a trion excitation? What happens if you have a bi-exciton excitation? Right? Because the thing about Green's function methods is that you can systematically improve upon them, right? This is, this is a really cool thing. One of, one of the things that some DFT practitioners actually really hate about DFT is that there's no nice diagrammatic expansion of the DFT total energy. 
Mm. Right? And so a lot of the time, you know, you'll do something like, ah, I did GW on top of, let's say, DFT with this funky functional. And immediately the people who've written the code will warn you that, well, it appears that you've used this funky functional. Be careful. We don't actually know what terms we're double counting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like yeah, you, you want mm -hmm. to be aware of this, right? But the counter argument to this is always going to be, I mean, the bulk modulus turned out fine, right? Which is I, which is not a great mm -hmm. argument, but you know, it it really depends on your observable of choice. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that goes back to um, my comment about Hogg's theorem yeah. and how like some observable can be very finicky. Um, I think that's true for any numerical methods, really. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, absolutely. I mean, I I haven't gone into the numerics here at all. Uh, later. Uh, hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Does anyone actually have any questions? We've we've been talking a lot, but if any if everyone else is like <laughs> done, um, aloof out here, just just calling us for t calling us out for taking too much time. Understandable, actually, because if not, I'll actually. Uh, I I think uh, you know if if we're done with all the questions, I'm gonna stop recording and then probably start the encoding process for this. Further mm -hmm. readings for high schoolers. Uh, Griffith's electrodynamics. Uh, Townsend's quantum mechanics. Uh, Ash, and eventually, once you're done with those two, Ashcroft and Merman's uh, solid state physics. The end. That's 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 your that's your high schoolers' readings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Federer and, and Wallach could continue. Uh, no, we are not telling undergrads and high schoolers to read Fetter and Waleka <laughs> Continuum Mechanics. This is not a good idea. Um, I'll, it's just someone please write it in chat for him. Griffith's e &M, and then Townsend uh, Quantum Mechanics. I'm going to stop recording. Um, for those who want the slides, I'll actually upload them in a bit. Right, but stopping the recording.